Hey, everybody out there in the world. My name is James Searle, and I am the bass player and also a songwriter in Giant Panda Gorilla Dub Squad. You are here, then you probably already know that. Was thinking about in the beginning of this uh, live broadcast, which we're going to talk about and focus on dub, which is a musical genre, um, that we would have some cool like dub delays and stuff. So you might have been expecting that, but there's nothing. And the reason is, is because I'm not a dub expert. I'm actually here to learn. So Giant Panda Gorilla Dub Squad, the reason that we have dub in our name might imply that you know we're dub specialists or um, been around the block a million times in the dub world and we're behind the mixing board producing tracks. But actually it comes from us uh, taking the name from a Tom Robbins novel called Another Roadside Attraction in which there is a band called the Giant Panda Gypsy Blues Band that kind of traveled up the 101 and with the Indo-Tibetan Circus. And at the time that we were changing our name from the Bomb Squad, we were doing a lot of traveling and going into festivals and setting up the solar power, uh, these sound systems and kind of just playing dub rhythms live improvisationally for eight hours at a time. So we were like guerrilla dub music. So we were not a gypsy blues band as much as we were a guerrilla dub squad. So as we've kind of moved on through the years, the first thing that we did was we put out an album called Slow Down that had absolutely no dub on it. It's like the driest album, dry as a bone. And people were confused as to why we were called the Dub Squad. And uh, just wanted to kind of talk about dub is this type of practice in music, in Jamaican music. That's that's at least what I do know about it. There's a lot of great documentaries out there that Reese Root Fire is going to feature throughout the month in the coming time where you can kind of learn about the actual history of dub. But where it came from for Giant Panda is that we were seeing these bands that had live dub happening. And that, that was part of their improvisation. So kind of like amazing jazz music or some jam band music, uh, there's a spot for improvisation. But with the dub, it would be like hard driving drum and bass, which is something that we all love in all music. And there would be this soundscape that wasn't all about guitar solos or Kind of getting to a normal rock band climax but kind of this other kind of deeper thing where everybody had to work together and the simple parts made a greater whole so we started seeking out these engineers uh that really knew how to dub things and uh make the live sound um dynamic in that way and the first thing that we learned about dub is that you have to really be an engineer uh, and know how to make reggae sound good out of a big sound system. So when you start kind of learning about who invented dub, it was these King Tubby and scientists and uh, these engineers, Duke Reed in Jamaica, that they were just like master technicians. They knew how to build speakers. They knew how to have the sound work through these machines and they knew how to make it uh, create these psychedelic effects that kind of um, would turn into big soundscapes in the dance. So that's our introduction to dub is seeing bands like John Brown's Body and even um, seeing bands like the Whalers play. They would have a little bit of dub like on the uh, vocal that would make it super deep and a special experience. So that's kind of our introduction. We did dub live and we would always work with an engineer who knew how to work the sound system. So some bands have a lot of different pedals on stage or different analog gear, different digital gear. There's a a lot of different ways to get to a similar place and dub is kind of that has that space where you can get there and everybody kind of recognizes it once you're there so um that's kind of what i wanted to start this talk out about being we're gonna see how many uh different producers we can talk to different people that kind of deal in dub and dub specialists uh, and see where they're approaching it from and see what their understanding is about the history and you know how they go about dub practice what they know about it because i think if we all focus on the individual stories and everybody's experience with dub then we'll all become kind of greater experts together and reggae is this kind of music that i really do believe is uh still in its infancy and dub is a part of that they you know they call it like reggae's little brother but remixing adding delay, adding reverb is something that is part of all music in the world right now. So that's kind of all from coming from Jamaica and coming from dub music originally. And 
while I'm giving this live stream, I'm happy that uh, people are joining us, uh, but I also want to give respect to uh, the people of Rochester, New York right now, which is my hometown. And I know that people are out on the streets right now on uh, Jefferson Avenue and, uh, you know, live in person, not just on the internet. And because, you know, they're saying fuck the RPD and uh, Daniel Prude say his name. There's been, you know, horrific police violence that's been happening all across the country and really all across the world. That's, um, you know, comes with the way that this system is set up and it's being revealed right now. And that reminds me of Dub a lot because Dub is kind of this way to like focus on all the parts. And like, if you think about a mixing board and you're like drawing down faders until you're just hearing the hi-hat and the drum and the bass kind of makes a better understanding of like the structure of the song. So Dub kind of became this sort of philosophy for me to think about other things and, and think about the world around me. And I owe it to the music and uh, to, you know, that Jamaican practice originally for giving me that tool that you can use outside of music and life is cool like that. You can do that with so many things you pick up along the way. So I want to acknowledge that Daniel Ponder is down there right now performing and they're having a peaceful protest. And I uh, just wanted to give my solidarity respect. Black Lives Matter every time. Keep going for it. Keep working on it. And we'll all keep working on it too, because uh, this time, you know, the pandemic and everything, we're all staying inside, we're all nervous. We don't really know what to do as a live musician. I know that we're gonna have uh, another live musician on shortly. Um, we haven't been able to work in the normal way uh, that we have for the past couple of years. So it's a very strange shift. And in Jamaica in the mid seventies, there was a whole lot of political violence that was happening, a very divided country. Um, the CIA was involved arming, you know, kind of the right wing militias and there were just gangs out on the streets killing each other with imported weapons. And it was a whole mess. And um, the sound system scene and the live music scene in Jamaica changed at that time too. And a lot of people kind of had to stay inside. Uh, I was fortunate to travel to West Africa when I was younger and uh, had conversations with producers there that described the same exact thing at the same time. So live music went underground and a lot of work started to happen in studios and a lot of remixes started to come out. And it was a way of, you know, keeping the work going and reimagining uh, the possibilities of being creative and getting the music to the people and also acting uh, as the messenger that, you know, music always has been in Jamaica. It was all about, like I said, the speakers and the engineers and they would build the sound systems and have the dance party in the street. And if you had a message, you recorded it that day and it played on the sound system and everybody got the message. But come, you know, 1977, curfew, all that stuff. People can't gather in the streets with a lot of folks anymore. Um, the music kind of started to take a, take a different turn. And so it reminds me of this time now. And so we released three singles last year and um, we really wanted to hear what they would sound like reimagined and dubbed by producers that we like and by artists who we admire. Uh, so we sent them out and they sent them back to us. And the first one that we did was released today. And the tune is originally called Stop Fighting. And uh, we released it under the name Memorial Dub today uh, in memoriam of uh, one of my best friends who passed away, but also passed around away right before September 11th, which was a time when again, our world really, really changed. And thinking about dub, lots of meditation, lots of sitting on couches, kind of staring at the ceiling, wondering what's going on with this world and where it's gonna go. Uh, there was dub playing and kind of offering me a foundation and a backbone to kind of think about and expand my ideas a little bit different than like getting out in the dance, a little bit different than um, performing a show. You know, music is here for us to reflect with and it's often a reflection of the things that we're going through. So even though this song is just about 20 years old, so many of the themes are relevant today and was really proud that Agent J, who's gonna join us in just a minute, um, was able to you know, really reimagine the tune and again, strip down the faders and focus on the drum and the bass and the groove and uh, some choice lyrics and stuff like that. So um, J, I know who he is because he plays guitar in one of my favorite bands called the Slackers. And the Slackers are known to be more of a ska band, uh, but I was listening to them at the time that I was getting into a lot of uh, reggae music and especially dub. 
and I was kind of listening to John Brown's body and I was listening to the slackers and I was listening to a lot of Bob Marley and a lot of burning spear. Um, that was before Jay was in the group, but, uh, we connected through Facebook, uh, throughout the years, I kind of started following him and was really interested every time he put out music under his name, crazy bald head. And so I just wanted to learn more about his approach to dub, uh, his, you know, the, what, what his history of dub is and just as a producer and as an artist himself, I know he's coming out of New York city. So we're going to bring him into the studio right now. And, uh, just like that. Hey, there he is. Yeah. Welcome to welcome to Gorilla Dubs, Jay. Thanks for joining What's us. What's happening, man? What's going on? Uh, I'm, you know, in my basement thinking about the world, thinking about dub, and just trying to process it all. And um, yeah. I'm glad that we have this, you know, kind of forum to connect on. It's very futuristic and uh, also a very old school conversation just at the same time. So, yeah. How are you? All right, man. Just uh, it's you know it's like pouring rain outside down here, but it's still warm. And uh, you know, I was working today. Just always some new pieces coming into the studio. Usually every month or so, like something new I'm changing. So it's like I still don't have a method down. So it's like the last few days I'm just kind of like messing with the new stuff and just kind of today I was doing some recording of demos and just doing stuff that isn't client work, just to kind of like get my feet wet with the new gear. You know, and uh, yeah, that's really it. Just hanging out. It's Thursday night. Where's your studio located? I'm in bed in Brooklyn. I just moved to this place a year ago, but I've been in this neighborhood for 14 years. Um, and now I have a basement. So now I have much more space, which is like a, a real luxury in New York with like tiny apartments. So actually I actually have this whole base, basement. So I have a decent size like mi uh, mixing and overdub room. And I even have like the back half of the basement. I could put like a drum kit and like a full band in, which I've yet to do wow. yet. Um, but I've tracked drums down there. So I'm like, you know, I'd be interested to do that. But, you know, it's like I'd have to kind of work on it with a band and kind of work out the sound treatment and mic placement and all that stuff. But uh, right now it's yeah. a comfortable room to mix in. You know, it's a lot more spacious than my last place. That's really cool. And I'm always kind of thinking about how so much music has come out of uh, such confined places or just that the space that you're in will affect what options you have. And yeah. New, New York is like a classic city for that, that I'm, I don't know how many people think about it, but a lot of people listen to music that's made in New York and it comes out of, you know, all sorts of spots. It's so. one of those things we kind of envy, you know, we have like good and bad. A lot of people come through New York. There's a lot of influences. It's, a, it's still a music town regardless of all the, everything going on the past few decades. But, um, you know, we envy people that like have garages, you know, or basements and houses where you could have a studio or you could rehearse in a garage or you have a car, you could drive to a gig, you know, it's exactly. Like, these are things we're like, man, we used to have to get like three cabs to go to a gig, you know, totally. and yeah, pay for and rehearsal time, you know, ex exactly. And everything I, I, this is kind of what I was thinking about, uh, dub in the late seventies in Jamaica, how, you know, I hate, bringing up that it's these awful things that sometimes put the pressure on making artists work really hard and like turns the coal into diamonds. I don't want to embrace that because I yeah. want life to be better for artists in, yeah. in general um, and not have to be put under unbelievable pressure, which, you know, so many people are, but that is totally the name of the game in New York city. Um, I, I remember being from Rochester and going up to New York a lot we people were always surprised that we could keep our band together or just like have one band because so many of the musicians are playing in 10 bands sure. just to just to you know keep food on the table and keep the rent paid and at the same time like you'd have to hustle that extra hard to be an original artist or get yeah. your project off the ground um so are you from new york yeah queens originally cool cool so uh, no g yeah, you know, I, I'm not from like a cool neighborhood in Queens. I'm from like a boring, like residential, you know, really quiet neighborhood. But uh, mm -hmm. um, lived in the city when I was like 17. I went to NYU for a minute and then uh, bounced around back home then crashed with friends and then lived in the Lower East Side for 10 years and then been in Brooklyn for 14 years. So, you so know, you it's, yeah, it's, it's, I don't like to move around. You know, I, I kind of, that's... You know, I've had places for a long time, and a lot of people in New York move every year or two, which is insane. But it's like, 
Yeah. What's that like to like just have a place to live that's your address forever? You know, I'd like that, right. but uh, it's almost impossible to be able to buy anything in New York. You know, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's the ninety nine serving the one. Like, just it's the way it's been for so long. It, it, I, artists somehow exist in the fringes of that, and you know, so yeah, many great and less. We'll see. A lot of people may be fleeing the city now if the, if offices are like a thing of the past, and so we're not overrun by, you know. Uh, professionals and tech people taking up all the apartments that exactly. may ease up the, the pressure on the housing in the city and, you know, maybe make yep. it affordable for like more fringe people, you know, to be able right. to actually right. afford a place. So we'll see. Yeah. And it's these unintended consequences that like New York has, has gone through some sort of periods like that where it's been cheap for artists to come and then it gets expensive and then the neighbor changes and all that it was so. really until you know sometime in the 80s 90s is when it really i was kind of like moving here as a teenager like downtown from from queens like it, like the last hurrah of like cheap apartments in manhattan and brooklyn was still affordable but of course as like a teenager you don't have any money so it's like I, right. You're always chasing the rent. Whenever you have the money, then the rent has gone up thirty percent. You know, so yeah, um, yeah, man, it's it, it's 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 definitely real. And um, you know, appreciate that you're a survivor that you've you've stayed there the whole time. You know, that's a real you know real New Yorker stuff. Uh, so respect. But um, so I I don't uh, want you know if you don't want to go through your entire musical history, I was kind of uh, wondering you seem to have always been a self-produced person and you had your kind of identity musically going before you got into the slackers. Um, is that, is that pretty accurate? Um, for the most part, only because I'm not a front person. So it's not like I had my own band that I could front and then potentially get a label when labels were a thing or whatever. So it was like, you know, that was a function of like, nobody really wanted to, produce my music nobody wanted to sell my music so i would just kind of i really owe a lot to king django um from originally from the boilers and then had uh skinner box and stubborn all-stars and then went solo and i was playing with him he invited me into stubborn all-stars and he uh, he bought some recording gear in 97 and uh, we had this basement in the east village that we rehearsed in and we you know, we set everything up and he just like had me come in and help him set it up. And that was really my like engineering school, literally wow. him showing cool. me how to wire up a tape machine and connect it to the board and what was the send and return and the pathway for everything and how the mics hook up and how the faders work and, you know, the EQs and how to spool up the tape and everything. And wow. that you know, and basically we were I was one of four people that got keys to the place. It was like him. Victor Ruggiero from the Slackers, Vic Rice, who's a yeah, producer sure. and like, you know, my main mentor behind the mixing board and myself okay. had keys. So basically we were allowed to just work down there and record down there. So I, we would just, I would just go down there, live blocks away and, and just get a drummer, get some friends and record stuff. And it just started like that and then get a singer for things eventually. Um, but that, that was really the start of it. You know, you can't really wait around for other people. You got to, just kind of do something just to keep, you know, even if 10 people hear it, you know, just to get it out of your head, you know, that, that, that's really exciting, man. That's a, a really nice story. And I didn't, uh, like, I realized that you played with King Django, but I didn't know that, uh, you know, there was kind of a start of a big recording scene through that. Oh, absolutely. And you, yeah, yeah. That was, you know, Victor Ruggiero one, and year zero of, you know, I had like amazing. a Fall X four track cassette thing in high school in the late eighties. You know, but I would just, I didn't have a bait. All I had was a guitar. And so I would just sit there playing little riffs and kind of, I couldn't even double it on bass or have any drums or anything. So I didn't really, I couldn't really make use of it. But I was always kind of fascinated by like multi tracking. And, you know, I grew up, my dad, you know, got, you know, was into Pink Floyd and stuff and, and Moody Blues. And so I was into music and my mom was into the Beatles. So I was always kind of interested in that. How records got recorded and, you know, it was it was fascinating. So it was uh, that was a really important day. Um, you know, Django like showing me how the stuff all hooked up and how, you know how it all led to the tape. You know, and yeah. eventually to the speakers. You know, that was like a revelation. 
Yeah, it's like truly modern magic. I just always imagine that anybody from any other time could could have wound up in that room with you, um, you know, kind of in a time travel sort of fantasy scenario. Um, just we take music for granted, we take recording for granted, and just the idea to capture time and see the signal go to the microphone and pass through the wires and into the mixing board and onto the tape is... And there is, like, now, like, you know, there's kind of been a revival. People have gotten back interested in tape recording and multi-tracking and stuff. But that that was, like, the last hurrah of, like, the end of the 90s was the end of the, really, of the analog era as of being the main way to record, you know. Uh, yeah. By the late 90s, the good studios were all getting, like, Did Pro you know Tools. They were getting a digital room that they would work with after they recorded and you know by the 2000s a lot of studios were just going straight to digital and mm -hmm. fencing with the tape machine and you know because it's a lot of maintenance to, to deal with those things it's like it's not like you just plug them in and press record you know it's a lot of work right. those things. yeah it's 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 like owning a bus or something yeah you constantly yeah, have to service it yeah it, it's i happen to be there like right at the you know, the twilight of that. So I'm really thankful that I happened to make that transition. It was funny, a few years earlier, before that, in the very early 90s, I went to film school at NYU, and it was before digital photography was the standard. So we actually, in my photography class, you know, it was still like, take pictures, get this developer, all these chemicals, and get <laughs> developing paper, and actually, like, that's how you had to print a photograph or right. shoot film on eight millimeter and go get it developed at this place and here's how you edit it here's how you splice it i was really like it's crazy to be like from you know a from different a time century, uh, literally uh, from another century where it's like those yeah. things still exist but they're not the standard anymore yeah you, yeah right on the digital divide like you're yeah. right there and i was gonna I, i'm very interested to know like how your ears have adjusted from that time if you have a reference to that like my my feeling is that um, I know how tape sounds and I know how digital sounds and I can hear a difference and I could hear a difference when I when like maybe in the early 2000s and I'm not an engineer at all, but I just trust my ears uh, pretty, pretty good. That's and the most important thing. I, and I, I can I can feel the difference of the feeling. Um, but then, you know, in, in Panda, we can talk about this later, but um, Panda was kind of um, really purist for a while so we really needed b3s and fender roads and tube amplifiers and all and i still feel that 100 percent. but now i'll plug into like a solid state bass amp and i'll recognize that it sounds different but i'll kind of like it and it happened with music that i listened to too different sounds make their way into recordings and musical styles and uh end up being on your favorite tracks uh as i started listening to more 80s and 90s reggae, I, I stopped hating synthesizers and the I music as much. And, and too, yeah. yeah, and I, I'm just curious as like someone who had a know how and an understanding and kind of like trained ears on the old style and event and got right into the new. Now you've had like 20 years of hearing all sorts of madness. I, you know, there's, there's been plenty of times that I've been fooled. A, my ears like. You know, I don't think we're ever that good. You know, we're guys like I, I engineer friends of mine that just amaze me where they can just tell instantly what's happening. They could hear the most subtle amount of compression or tell exactly where an EQ is being cut or pushed, you know, something like that. So my ears, I don't think are that good to begin with. Um, and definitely playing live and my age, like I've lost some in some certain areas. Luckily, mm -hmm. nothing major. Um, but you know, I, I've been fooled a lot. I've heard amazing stuff that's been done all in the box, you know, all on computer, right. everything just like gone direct, all the amps right. modeled, you know, tape emulators, like all the delays and reverbs are all plugins and it sounds amazing. And I've heard, and I've, I'm sure I've turned out like stuff that's analog that sounds like crap, you know? Right. Um, it's yeah. not. Analog is not a, like a magic wand. It's like the reason people went digital is because analog is like really tough. You know, it's like there's a lot of work to like tame it, you know. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's really like you said, like ears are the most important thing.
you know, um, if you have good ears and you know your technology, whatever it happens to be, you can make great sounding stuff all on computer. You can make great sounding stu stuff with like a cassette recorder, you know, right. and most of what re recording really is um, capturing a performance, you know, we've gotten so into like post-production and all the great things we can do after the recording has taken place that we kind of forget that like, no, you have to start with a good recording rather than just manufacturing stuff and sample. It's like, I have to remember that a lot of times, like, oh, I can do this, that, and the other thing. And then I'm like, wait a second, that's going to take hours. Whereas it's going to take three minutes for me to go back and get a better take or to tell the artist I'm recording, no, do that better. You can do that better. Let's take another couple of passes. You know, right. we need to remember that dry is kind of the best way to start. You know, if you get a good recording dry, then the sky's the limit, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that, you know, that's what every great engineer says. And um, yeah, to say that I have the ears to tell the difference, I, I, I don't have the ears to necessarily tell the difference between anything. But I thought that I did uh, kind of right when that stuff started. You hear something on a tape machine and you'd be like, oh, that just sounds warmer or it sounds older. I had this, uh, this like old, uh, bureau in my house. I guess that's what you'd call it. Or it's like a stand and it has a speaker in it with a tape player and a record player. Right, right. And like you could flip up this thing, you know, they had a bunch of them in the maybe sixties and seventies. And, uh, I hadn't listened to cassette tapes in 15 years, maybe. And I have a bunch of them. I put it in and that's when I felt that feeling from a cassette that I wouldn't have been able to recognize unless 20 years had gone by. Mm -hmm. And I was now an adult and I connect that feeling with my childhood there's something on the sound of the tape that i feel i can i can tell right. that like a lot of it of, can be sentimentality where it's just right it sound better but you just you have good feelings attached to that sound you know yeah yeah it's a it, and it's a funny thing because it's it's obviously something very subtle it, it would be you know very physics of sound to kind of be able to explain it you'd have to be somewhat of a scientist or very engineered to identify yeah, why Heard, that I, I happens. Saw, but. Um, scientist, the, the dub engineer who was Tubby's, you know, main student, and really, in some ways, it kind of eclipsed him. Um, but he was saying, so you know, a week or two ago, posting that like he's all about digital. He's like he put his time in it. on the analog stuff, and he's like analog has limitations as far as the, you know, hearable spectrum. Whereas he's like digital, you can hear, you know, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz can be reproduced digitally and you don't lose right. any generation. So he was just like, goodbye to analog, you know, all about digital. So if you can do it, you know the technology and you can get the sound you want out of it. Sure, I, I don't doubt it. I'm not a, certainly not an analog purist. For me, I go partially analog because it helps me kind of stick the track together more. But, um, you know, I, I've heard great stuff. Like I said before, people have done stuff all digital. It just sounds amazing and old, you know? Yeah, for, for sure. There's, I, again, it's kind of about what you said, like how much of a visionary, like how much you can see how the technology works um, and how you explain scientists. He knows the, uh, he knows how far you can get with digital because he yeah. understands the science, the science yeah. of it. And that was what was, I was kind of trying to talk about in the beginning is me as a bass player and a musician, I haven't delved into uh, engineering as much. It's not something that comes easily to me. And I definitely know people that that's more of their back. Uh, they mm -hmm. really can understand. They see things like how, a, how somebody who draws or paints sees things in a different way from a person who can't paint. Um, it's just uh, some people seem to be more inclined to it. And it was so cool to learn about the foundations of dub and how like I was saying in the beginning of the um, stream here that those those guys all built speakers and knew exactly how all of the equipment yeah, worked and kind of how like radio King, King repair Jang, guys, electric repair right. guys. Right. King Tubby, the name Tubby came from because he knew how to handle tubes and vacuum cleaners or something or, or TV. Tubes oh, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. Is, is, is what I've heard is that how he got the Tubby name. But um, yeah, so it like King Django uh, showed you. Um, yeah. And we didn't do kind of like, you know, I, I haven't gotten into repair and it's, it's like, I've been a guitar player for a long time. I never like mess with my guitar or amp, you know, I've changed some tubes or stuff like that, but I don't feel confident enough. 
like, all right, a couple times I've had to like solder the spring tank, the reverb tank, but as far as mm -hmm. really opening it up and getting into schematic and, and doing stuff like that, I haven't messed with that. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a whole world and there is a lot. That's why I definitely feel like, you know, a novice still with that stuff a lot because those guys really understood the electronic pathway, the voltage, they understood phasing, they, you know, like resistance and how all of this affected the sound. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You know, those guys weren't just playing with delays and reverbs. That's not right. it at all. Those guys were like master engineers before they ever touched, you know, a spring tank or, or you know, a tape delay or anything. They knew how to get mixes that were, you know, dropped. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that, again, it must have been so cool for them to hear the possibilities once they figured it out. And they were building delay uh, spring reverb boxes. And, yeah. you know, th that must have, I, to have the understanding of the science, kind of like being a great jazz musician, which I am not. But like when you understand what Charlie Parker's playing, it's that much, you know, greater. Yeah, definitely uh, that like epiphany moment, you know. And then especially, I, you know, something I really, was really an eye-opening thing. 25 years ago, I went to Jamaica and something that I was, had only been getting into Jamaican music for a couple of years at that point, um, but something hit me like a lightning bolt, the whole concept of version and, you know, by extension, dub about reusing a rhythm. Why, you know, people are like, well, why do they sing over somebody else's rhythm? That's kind of not done in like American and British, like popular music. You never hear like, oh, you know, whatever, uh, Arthur Kay from, you know, uh, Steppenwolf is going to sing over this like Led Zeppelin rhythm. You know, it's like right. nobody does that. Why would they right. do that? And it seems like they're kind of cheating or like being cheap. And then when you go to Jamaica, you realize it's an island that doesn't produce that much manufactured goods. So everybody reuses everything mm -hmm. from like glass bottles that were once liquor bottles you could fill with juice to like a car where it's like, Oh, well, this motor burnt out. We put another motor in it. Oh, that doesn't work. Let's like hitch it to like a mule. And now it's a cart. You know, it's like everybody reuses everything. And then that's it became yeah. obvious like, oh, yeah, the B side, they're going to make a version without vocals. So it can be reused. So the, the rhythm spreads around more. And then from there, it's like, well, how can we change the rhythm a little bit and put our own stamp on it? You know, it, it's, it's a really fascinating thing the Jamaican mentality of, of resourcefulness. It, it is so fascinating and I trip out about it all the time. And I wanted to kind of bring that up exactly. Um, you phrased it really well, how it's about recycling to a certain extent Absolutely. Um, and, and, and reusing and making, making use of what's there. So that is uh, really cool. I also uh, always think about it as terms of like economics or like, it's like a, another hustle, like, Oh, I have one song and there's 10 sound systems. I can, you know, do this on, you know, yep. quit, I had a, I had a full day in the studio. I can rip off 10 different versions of these songs right. and sell them to 10 different promoters. Again, I don't know or if it was instead of having to record cut. a second song for the B side. It's like, Oh, let's exactly. get a percussionist. This guy's got some yeah. DJ lyrics or let's just play with some effects on it. And now we have a B side and we could save that other track for another single, you know? The right. bad side to that is they ended up also recycling tape. So a lot of these, the, the original masters of these recordings are, are gone. Yeah. Over. Yeah. Uh, right. But, Which is also it is. miss. It's like adds the mystique to it. And it's so, yeah. you know, ever, how many times have you had a great take and then it, for some reason it wasn't recording. Man, um, I, just I taped <laughs> over, I accidentally deleted a whole guy's record. I was recording. I was recording an EP for somebody. I had laid down all the tracks. I paid the band out of the budget money. I bet it was really good. Yeah, it was, <laughs> man, and I actually re-recorded it with a different bass player, same drummer, like days later, and the client to this day still does not know the difference. They had already gotten the basic tracks and stuff, and they never knew, and I still came in under budget, but yeah, that's one of the, See, you know, yeah. You're, 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 you're the real deal. This is, this is the, but, these uh, are the thoughts yeah, of I mean, the that dub was an magician. Epic, epic fuck up on my part. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, it turned out to uh, make it what it was. And I think that was the case for so many dubs. And again, um, they're not, I don't think, and they weren't dwelling on any of the decisions that they were making. Um, like, oh, how's that delay? Uh, you know, probably I, just. I, I wonder, you know, it's like. it's. I, I think, don't know. Yeah. 
I, I always assumed that they kind of just did it on the fly and did it. And then I've been reading a lot of recent stuff that scientists have been posting. And, you know, at least he makes it out like they really took their time. You know, they would have to do it all in one day because it's not like you could hit save and come back to it and remix it another day. You had another session with another artist. So if you had that time booked, you went in and recorded it or voiced it. You had to come there with your mix done. So I was amazed at the quality they turned out. So I guess part of it is is got to be on the fly to have to make quick decisions and commit to it. But right. also, again, it's really knowing their gear and you know knowing moves and tricks they had done before that are going to sound good. You right, know, so and like mm -hmm. um, yeah, and just being you know the the, the uh, sorry the like you know ninety nine percent preparation one percent imagination you know so it's like you can do something on the fly if you've done it already ninety nine times you know. Yeah, and that that performance thing that you discussed before, like that's true of an engineer too. Doing the dub, they if, if it you're is solid with your performance, yeah. if you're if you're if you're practiced and if you have talent and have gotten the skill of the talent up, then you know those guys that's are all so so I'm something to say. To, yeah. Yeah, not not to not to say necessarily that they were just like, oh fuck it, whatever on this delay. They knew how to dial it right in, and yeah. I I just don't think that yeah they were moving fast. Yeah. Probably, oh yeah. Yeah, not uh, for me. I'm like sitting on something for like a couple months, and I'm like, oh, maybe we should take that snare drum down a little bit, or you know, it's it's the luxury of time, but I, it's also there's know, something to be said for just like getting that. I out. do. I I go between both. I I feel sometimes I rush my own tracks, and I'm like, wait a second, man, just stop, listen to it for a couple of weeks, sit on it, change that thing if it's bothering you. You know, if you put it out, it's going to be bothering you forever. Change it. But then I also try and get into to a good like work regimen of just like no you need to turn out a certain amount of work you need to like not sit on a mix forever like know what you're doing and do the work properly so that you know at the end of the day you, you're coming out with a mix you're confident about you know it's uh you know it's two different things like it's you know in fact i just now just got an email back for i think posting the thing about this people were reminded in like so literally a client I finished a record for like two months ago, just a regular record, um, just messaged me back like, hey, can you change this one little thing? You know, like I turned in the masters like two, mm -hmm. maybe two months ago or something like that. I finished the record. But it's like, okay, but they listened to it. It's not out yet. And they decided this thing is bothering them and they'd rather fix it than put it out and have it bother them forever. So I'm like, yeah, no problem. Man. I'll, I'll go back. I'll take a listen. I'll, you know. But um, I'm getting back into the performance thing. I just am incorporating a mixing board back into the digital setup now. So now I'm like, oh, wait, I can't automate all this stuff. I have to actually do it with my hands. You know, I have right. to, like, remember this part is happening and that's happening and then hit this and that. I can't just, like, take my time, like, and just dial in every little thing and automate it and then just print it, you know. So yeah, it's a, I, it's a learning curve getting back to that. You know? Yeah, and it's ch there's chops. I'm sure, like uh, you gotta kind of have your chops up, uh, mm. like any like anything. Um, so when you so let's talk about stop fighting. I sent you those tracks in a very different way than it was happening in the '70s in Jamaica. This is a new phenomenon to be able right. to send a bunch of waves across the internet and have somebody easily just get them and open them up in probably some sort of digital audio workstation mm -hmm. and uh, make a new version out of it. So I was just kind of wondering if you could give a little synopsis of like, if you remembered receiving the track and like, what is your game plan when you get? Yeah, uh, I forget. Did you, guys send me, you guys sent me stems of the actual mix, right? Or did you, did I, you send me raw tracks? I forget. I think we sent you raw tracks. Okay. So, you know, that is like, Literally, you know, before a dub is a remix. So, you know, when you're getting raw tracks, it's like getting a reel of tape. It's not as much work, you know, as spooling it up and getting it. But it's like you first have to mix the tune before you can mm -hmm. do any remixing. You still have to get sounds out of the stuff. Fortunately, you guys, and there's a, a few other bands, luckily, I'm able to work with that are just really tight, recorded really nicely. Everybody knows what they're doing. Everybody's going for the same sound. So... Fortunately, the mix part of it wasn't that much work. You know, it was like just kind of yeah. take away 
little thing here or there that I didn't like, push some things. And so it was like, it was sounding good right away. It was like, you know, within whatever, two hours or so, I was like, okay, this is all, you know, pretty much a cool mix of the tune. And then, you know, from there, it's like, like okay, now we can actually have some fun and actually play around with the tune and pull some things in and out and stuff. But it's like having a clean, nice tune, you know, that's like more than half the battle. That's like 90% of the battle, you know, if you mm -hmm. have a good recording to begin with and a good mix, it's like, you can't cover up a shitty mix with like delays and reverbs. I've tried, like you can't, but it's like, all you're doing is like actually multiplying the shittiness by sending it through a delay, you know? So right. it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, right. that, that fortunately with you guys, that was absolutely not a problem. It was just oh, wow. like pure niceness. Yeah, it was, it was cool. uh, a pleasure. Um, yeah, we, it was it was it was cool that you had an understanding of exactly the kind of dub that I think we were looking for, which was just like heavy drum and bass. And uh, again, what you were saying is that as much as you could try to bury something with reverb and delay, it just highlights it. And dub and dub remixing to me is like it's like a highlighter, like you're taking things away so you can appreciate the little exactly. parts yeah. that make make you kind of yeah. sway back and forth or yeah you, when you catch like a certain lyric and it the reverb rides out you stick with that thought a little bit and yeah i, I love finding little things in the track that you like we're not really aware of you knew they were there but then it's like oh cool the clavinet's playing this cool little thing that like if i just leave the clavinet and bass and drums on it's like you know, it's almost like its own melody that's happening there or whatever. It's like different things can come out exactly when you take away stuff, you know? Yeah. And uh, you, so there's a funny part of that song where I wrote it to like go up a half step, which doesn't necessarily happen in like the middle of a reggae track necessarily. Not that we're a all out reggae band, but um, in that part, there's like a lot of New Orleans ish horns going on and like, yeah. not, like just a lot of swelling and, a lot yeah, of it's noise. like a New Orleans kind of second yeah. line section going and so, on. Yeah. So, yeah, somewhere in there, I like went like, whoa! Or like exactly, I just of, like, back and, to that. And you caught that, like that's yeah. what, so I, I wouldn't, again, I didn't even really know that that was there or remember I love doing the, that. off the mic stuff. Like I love when you hear the drummer counting in a tune, I try and like mm -hmm. amplify that and send it that's through so the cool. But yeah, I love, and I never know if it's like, you know, cause a lot of times on tracks when stuff's recorded, you know, not everything is gated or cleaned up, especially like with analog tape, you gotta be very careful. You could accidentally end up erasing part of your track. So they generally kind of leave in all the off mic chatter. So there's usually a lot of bleed and sometimes you'll hear musicians talking like, okay, here we are, we're coming into this section with the bridge, you know, something like that. And so you never know if it's intentional or whatever, but I heard that. And so I always look for like, That's great. you know, off mic, like, things like that, people talking in the studio, and I'm like, that's going in the mix, you know? That's that's really cool. Yeah, that's, I think, one of my favorite things about uh, about just dub in general. I'm glad that people actually look for, you know, that stuff. Um, I, I, I always think about, uh, yeah, um, So Much Trouble in the World, Bob Marley, very famous, you know, song, but, like, right in the beginning of that, you hear some, like, some talking in the studio. Right. It's, like, the start of the album. Um, and so that, anyways, little caveat. But uh, so I was wanting to also ask you just about um, Crazy Bald Head, just the project. Like when that started, is that always been kind of like your moniker? Um, and when did you start getting asked to dub tracks and also presenting live as like a, a, a dub, a, as a dub performance, which you do sometimes, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, nobody's performing anything, but uh, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, you know, it started basically it was the same. It was just a studio thing, and I just needed a name. Um, and obviously it's named after, like, a Bar Marley track, which is, you know, just kind of a name for, like, a, like you know, troublemaker. Somebody who's, like, you know, given, like, Rasta's a hard time and kind of, you know, the man is, you know, right. cops and soldiers and all that shit. That's a name for it. It's not, you know, not like that's what I'm about or anything, but just, uh, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that could be like, you know, if you're like the white kid with the shaved head, you know, around a bunch of Rastas, that's probably what they're going to be calling you behind your back, you know? Um, yeah. 
or to your face, you know. Fair, so fair I enough. kind of took that as a name, as kind of, you know, a self-deprecating kind of name. And so it was always a studio project. And I did one or two gigs in the early 2000s, and they were kind of pickup gigs. Um, I don't sing, so I'd have to work with different singers, and it was just always a pain in the ass trying to get a band together, get people together. And then around 2011, um, this crew of uh, these promoters of these soul shows, their their collective, their group is called Dig Deeper, and they would bring soul artists to town and get a good backup band and get a good venue and a lot of like one hit wonder soul artists that haven't performed in you know 40 or 50 years and they would do this and they wanted to get jamaican shows together too and uh you know once or twice a year bring people to town where they wouldn't have to play way in the outer boroughs and like a lot of people sing to like you know a cd of their tracks you know and it's kind of a lot of times it's kind of bullshit they wanted to get good bands that knew the music so they got me to get the band together to be the backup band so we did Stranger Cole, we did Ken Parker, oh, wow. we did Ken Booth, we did uh, Keith and Tex, Gay Lads. Wow. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It was a really good experience learning all this stuff. Derek Morgan, it was great to work with all these people and back them up. And, Amazing. you know, especially some of the artists that was like some of the earliest music I listened to when I got into Jamaican music as a teenager. And now, like, you know, you're the guy they're consulting on stage. You know, that was really... Uh, very cool thing. So that was like the live band thing. We would always throw in some originals to open the show. And then, I don't know, a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago, I got some gear that like, uh, you know, like an outboard controller with faders where I could do, bring out rhythms on a, on my computer, multi-track sessions and, bring, you know, bring some effects and, and this mixing board and, and do stuff live where it would just be me. Cause it's a lot of DJs and getting a band together is sometimes hard. So sometimes I was like, Hey man, this, I could do this with just me and I could kind of be in between bands where it'd kind of be a performance, but a little more than a DJ, but less than a band. And so it was cheaper for venues and it was interesting for people to hear, especially I had tracks of, you know, stuff that nobody else had. I had slackers recordings, the frighteners, right. The, my own stuff, the Far East, um, you know, you guys would definitely make it on. I haven't done a session since then, since I did your track, but you guys would absolutely make it on it. You know, Bandulus, like a lot of cool bands that um, I would definitely bring out now, um, but I haven't done it. It's been, we were supposed to do one on 420 for the 420 booze cruise, but we obviously weren't able to do it this year. Um, right. Legend, legendary cruise that you guys. It's fun. Out. Yeah. Yeah. We do it. Yeah. Uh, Dub is a weapon is the live band, and then I do the dub, the you know live dub set in between, which is a lot of fun. So yeah, I've been doing that yeah. really since 2016. I forgot what, exactly what the question was. I've been rambling on too long. Yeah, no, that no, that that you totally answered the question, and um, I yeah had thought maybe you'd been doing it for longer, but I guess not that live. might be around the not live. Okay, for bands, I've um, been doing on and on. I mean, really, since the first dub thing I did was uh, we did this thing in Virgin City around '98. Maybe 99, we did this record called Version City Dub Clash, where me and Django and Vic Rice and Vic Ruggiero each did like two or three tunes for an LP. And, you know, it was like a, a four way clash, but it was really just all of us working on different rhythms. And it was really interesting to hear different people's style, you know, the kind of stuff they did. And, you know, some very unorthodox stuff like Django would do, like find weird settings on the delays or, use weird noisemakers and then Vic Rice's stuff, which is like very regimented. He has like really a system and a sound he goes for and really gets all his effects dialed in and has them just running full time and just pulls things in and out, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I was just kind of in between kind of learning from everybody, hearing what everybody was doing and listening to like, you know, obviously like Tubby and Scientist and Jammies and, you know, the Randy's stuff and Dub Specialist and just trying to incorporate that stuff the, the best I could. Is that available um, like out on YouTube and digitally now, or is that it a record? Um, I'd, lo I'd love to, I'm gonna look for that. Um, it was put out on LP and CD. I think it was, oh, eventually, I think the LP came later, only a few years ago, actually, but it was put out on CD, and I'm sure somebody's probably uploaded it to YouTube, or it's out there somewhere, maybe Bandcamp on Stubborn Records, but Version okay. City Dub Clash. It was it was a lot of fun. That was like a cool 
thing. And I, our buddy Ants from Skavuvi drew the cover. And so it had like one of those classic, you know, cartoony dub record yeah. covers, like, you know, whatever. Like scientists. Jamal, yeah, yeah. Limonius or Jamal Pete, who did those covers. Okay. Uh, which I love. Oh, man. Um, I, yeah, you know, um, coming up kind of a little bit after you, uh, we owe a lot to the people in New York that were making dub and kind of that whole crew that you're talking about, but it was really hard to understand who that was and what everybody was doing. We were kind of aware that people had been making these versions and new reggae, you know, new reggae right. that was in the style of versions and, and older roots and dub. Um, but it was always, you know, kind of a mystery, like so much in music was that I think back then before we were always like connected all the time. But um, so I didn't realize that you guys were all there together at Version City. I didn't, yeah. I've heard those names, I've heard all those names. I didn't know, you know, the story. Yeah, either, yeah. So oh, I'm glad that we got that out. I mean, it was Django's studios, his gear, and he held the lease on the basement space. But it was kind of this collective. It was like really a great three years or two About. and a half years. It was like really an amazing time that really, you know, it, it, it seemed like a long time, but it's like the blink of an eye. And I wish I had done more, but I actually did a lot of stuff down there and I learned a lot. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there was an interesting thing because, you know, at least, I don't know if you're like me, like you, we grew up on music where like we were used to a band or a singer and that's who was right. on the record, you know? And sometimes I would hear stuff where it'd be like, oh, this is Elvis or this, this singer, but I'm like, or this band, but I'm like, wait, they don't have a string section. They don't have a harp player. Like, who are these other people playing this? Is that them? And you don't really realize like about studio musicians and all that. And then especially right. when you get to dub or the producers, you know, you you hear records that you're like, you know, like one of my favorite records ever in any genre, certainly dub is uh, this Jacob Miller record, Who Said John O'Dredd, which was recorded at uh, Randy's in 74, 75. And it's Jacob Miller A-sides, like the vocal version with the, the dub right after it. And that's something that always, like, when I first got into that, I was like, what's happening here? Like, okay, it's it's him singing this, but, like, what's happening with the dub? Like, who's doing that? It, it doesn't really credit that. And you don't really know who's doing what, who's in the band, like, the producer, you know, of all this. And it's like, well, who's really responsible for this track? Like, who wrote it? Like, he's the singer, but he's being brought in to sing something else. Who got the band together? Who's doing this mix? And that was always the fascinating thing about the, the kind of studio system, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's always been really fascinating to me also. And again, it might be common knowledge for a lot of people about your story and Version City and, and that time, but it's not for me. No, um, so I'm really, it, it may be a common knowledge for like 13 people. I think you know. Thank well, you. I wanna I wanna give a shout out to J L M the third who's up on the chat who um he's been loving no fun with Danny Toot. Um is that is that is that the artist name, Danny Toot? Oh yeah, yeah uh Tute. Yeah, yeah. Tute, Tute. Yeah. yeah, um she just sang sounded... a track of mine, not a my it's it's an old Stooges tune called uh No Fun. Um which I just put out like a week ago or so. And I've just been making tunes here, like in between client or slackers work. And I was like, oh man, I need another ska tune to put out. And you know, I'm like trying to think of something that's like thematic for like quarantine. And I was like, oh, I gotta, gotta do this too. No. You know, it's like, this is everybody's, you know, theme song right now. So I just no, kind of worked it out and found the right drums for it, worked it out. And Roger Rivas from the Agrolytes oh. sent me some piano and organ and, Danny, my lady, she sang on it. Um, so yeah, that just came out. So I'm glad somebody's I, listening to it. I, I definitely uh, checked when you put out something recently. I checked it, but I didn't realize or remember that that was the name. And he's also shouting out Sound of 69 in yeah. the fourth right. So, you yeah. know, people are listening and they know. And I uh, yeah. also want to give a shout out to Kayla, uh, DJ Kayla Kush. She's out in Madison. And um, again, part of this, uh, you know, reggae enthusiast network that we have here that we're lucky to be connected through this music on the Internet. So yeah. it's really nice to see people coming out and, and it's, just it's very cool. want to be part of the conversation Coming out there. You know, it used to be like, you know, you made like a demo or you put out a CD or a seven inch and you literally like walked around to record stores in the East Village and like 
tried to convince them or the West Village to like take a couple copies and like, you know, and they'd be some old grumpy like record store guy. I'd be like, yeah, give me three. And like, you'd have to come back in a month to see if he'd sold any for him to give you, you know, $5 or something. Or usually you'd come back, they'd all be gone. He can't remember selling them. They just disappeared. So he's not going to pay you or, you know, it was always something like that. But now it's like you could actually put music out. And luckily, if you have a couple people tuning in, it's cool. You get a few people around the world, around the country that, you know, check it out and hear it. It's it's inspiring. Yeah, you know? it, it is. It's a way it's really an incredible way to share and connect when we use it, you know, for for, for those things. Um, mm. And it's it's been great to again, I, I feel like I kind of started having an awareness that people in the United States made reggae all over the country um when in like 2005 or 2006 i thought it was like just this little pocket of new york where like in rochester there's always been an original reggae band but and right. people that have reggae connections but I mean, you, you know once it, yeah yeah like, you, you meet people it's like the old hippie reggae guy in almost every like town that like had a little reggae scene since the early 80s or even 70s you know and they were into yeah. it you know and you're like oh wow cool people are into this and uh yeah it, you know everywhere yeah. Everywhere. And then yeah. definitely the last 20 years, it seemed to snowball with like dance hall, like kind of getting big. So like dance hall nights that were actually having kind of hits, you know, were kind of mixing with R&B and hip hop and stuff. So like dance hall stuff was getting played at like R&B hip hop nights. Yeah. So it would be this next awareness. They weren't really into oldies or ska, but there was like an awareness of reggae, you know, yeah. um, and it was modern. So it was like, uh, it was cool. There would be little pockets of stuff. you would be like, okay, I'm not really into this, but at least, okay, there's a dance hall night at this club, you know, after our gig or something like that. You know, they were trying. They were right. just trying to get something going in whatever little town, you know. You know, traveling around the country a bunch, um, I have that faith that there is, there are those pockets everywhere and those people do exist and you can find them. But when my wife told me that she got a job in South Bend, Indiana, it wasn't like screaming out to me like this right. is where I want to move right. um, and live in, you know. So I, it was kind of like moving to the moon um, yeah. and that everybody oh, else was. Yeah, everybody else that I knew was, um, you know, in New York or like on in the West Coast. And um, it got very I, I kind of it was very isolating to kind of be far away from the scenes that I knew. But you know, after being here a couple of weeks, I saw this sign that was like International South Bend Reggae Fest. And anytime I would talk about reggae, people would say, oh, have you been to the reg International Reggae Fest in South Bend? There's Which stuff I actually, you're there now. You're, you're in the end. All right, yeah, so I, I, I'm, in, I'm in South Bend. And like the long and the short of it is that I ended up meeting that guy who's in every town, who's been, had a radio show. His name's David Alert. And he's been playing on the Notre Dame radio station for 25 years wow, awesome. every Saturday night. A radio show and you know i'm so uh i i'm so grateful to like the people in every area that have kept that hustle up because that's a grind man to like love like the chicago music so much that, seen, like i'm sure chicago like, has huge reggae i mean like just classic like and then there was again, like more our scene like the green room rockers they're they're semi-active they're down in lafayette or something so like they're kind of in between they're kind of the far end of the state but the, you know this there's, there's some stuff happening Turns out, no, I mean, it turns out there's like tons of incredible reggae musicians around here and like in between from here to Detroit, there's just like a really interesting uh, musical history that includes reggae and like some of the guys that I'm not sure if it's like uh, Joseph Hill's backup band uh, or like like people who played with culture for a long time. I know that they live close to here. There's a lot of, uh, you know, just different West Indian artists, even um, a big community here from Malawi in South Bend from Africa that like I uh, linked up with some people that play like all original like Malawian reggae and wow. um, so it's been really cool to just like know and connect with people everywhere that have found what feels like a niche but is right. obviously one and of the you know to, for to, to me the greatest people, music in the world yeah to have people add to it to have people show up that are into it you know it's got to be like yeah you know it's it's good that that was, you know, always a good thing about New York. There would always be somebody showing up that, like, was enthusiastic. And it added to, like, the competition where you, you couldn't just, you know, think you had things locked down or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's always some next kids showing up that were, like, 
going to get more insane about the gear or their knowledge of the music or the records they were buying or spinning. And, you know, so you couldn't ever, you know, just kind of relax and chill, but it was, it was good because you'd end up hooking up with these people and like making yeah. tracks and, you know, then you know them for years. And I find myself like calling friends of mine that I like engineered when they were 15 and I'm like, Hey man, uh, you ever use this kind of uh, compressor? Uh, how do you, say, you know? And it's like getting advice from those people, you know. So it, it happens. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I love that, and I'm, I'm loving meeting people that are like getting into uh, reggae because of bands that I know or like friends of mine that have been playing for a long time, and I'll meet younger people who that's what they came up on, and it's always uh, really interesting to hear that that's considered part of this scene or this movement you right know? right um that you know just so it's it's really a pleasure and a, and an honor to be talking to you and to be getting some of this would, history and just I, to work together so thanks man when i uh dj'd for you guys um at mercury lounge i was really impressed with the band i'd never heard you guys i'd heard good things about you and a lot of people were like heard i was djing that show they were like oh man they're good and whatever so i was like oh cool you know obviously it's like all right you're headlining like a decent club you obviously know how to play and you're gonna have a crowd but i was really impressed with the playing of the band and it Thanks, like man. um you know like the four-part harmonies it was like a big like well put together sound and it was like modern but it was obvious like steeped in the classics you know there was like a lot of steel pulse and obviously like whalers and stuff in the sound but it wasn't just cliche like ripping them off it, like in spirit oh, they thank were you. There, you know? so i was really impressed with you guys thanks man yeah i always i think what, what the saving grace for us is that like we couldn't rip them off if we tried man so yeah. we don't <laughs> and you yeah, sound the way we sound it i want to give a big shout out to tony g who's our keyboard player uh who's a phenomenal player and probably hadn't played any reggae before or, or I, I I'm I'm trying to stop saying reggae because honestly, like I say, it's reggae-ish music. Like it, it's definitely coming from us loving reggae and wanting right. to be a part of that sound. Um, but uh, I'm less and less wanting to be like, oh, we are playing that same right. style of music. You know, right. it's not it's, really it's, that. Everybody's got their own. They yeah. should have their own take on it, and you have to be original. You know, there's a this. I mean, a lot of genres have that problem where just everyone's trying to rip off the classic artist or the just the cliches of the genre mm -hmm. just to fit in. Um, reggae seems to be like particularly a main offender at that. A lot of reggae bands and artists, so it's 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 a struggle, you know, to like do something original but stay within the formula because you you're yeah too yeah you feel like this isn't yeah like you know this is different altogether you know. Yeah, I respect the aesthetic, but I wanted to say about Tony that um, I often see when we're playing on stage, like other great keyboard players, like in the reggae genre, come stand on his side of the stage and like watch what he's doing. So right. it's it's been a pleasure to for me to be in like a group that's had changing members throughout the years and see these incredible mu musicians come in and kind of learn about the reggae aesthetic. Uh, and I think often people are like, oh, it's really easy. You're kind of doing the same thing the whole time. And then to immediately realize this is very, you got to be doing the same thing like the right way the right. whole time. Like, it's, yeah, you know, like, not and like work together. And yeah, it's very easy to, to see like exactly like it's just, oh, I, it's, it's simplistic. I could just do that. But it's like to really catch the the flavor of it. It's like there's so many different variations of it. But the thing I, I try and think about, especially with ska, but definitely with reggae, it's like before those music existed, the, the people that, you know, really started it in the 60s and 70s, they didn't grow up playing reggae. They didn't grow yeah. up playing ska. They were playing jazz. They were listening to big band, rhythm and blues. Some of them were like rock players, you know, playing guitar, playing country songs and, you know, stuff like that. So if the greats, you know, the, the foundation players that started the music didn't originate as reggae players. Right. Then anyone that really just uses their ear and just learns and, you know, just plays the best they can while staying, you know, true to the music can can be a great player at it, you know? That, that's that's a really good point. And, and I really, yeah, it's been, again, it's been a really nice, um, it's been very fortunate for me to find the genre and the aesthetic is like, I think it lines up a lot with like a lot of different kind of personal ideals or like socio-political or whatever. This isn't like everybody's fighting to play like the most notes. This is everybody's working together to create a structure that like someone can shine on 
whether they're singing um, or whether it's that you're leaving space to like make the space be the thing that's shining. Um, I really appreciate that. And yeah, just wanted to, uh, you know, thank you for working with the music and um, thanks for being a part of this. And another person who just, I, I was going to say we met, I, I, I followed you on Facebook and that's uh, kind of how I know more wow. about, about you. And another person that has been really interesting to start following is um, Andy Basford. Is that his name? Oh, Andy Basford. Yeah. Andy Basford, I, I who's I just have like to go see him again. But yeah, he's my teacher. That's so awesome, man. He, he like the he, he provides a window now that we have this space to kind of connect and be friends of just like all of this uh, culture and history yeah. of of this music that he was there for. So to kind of yeah. hear his memories and just, I don't even know him. I, I've never met him. Um, I first saw but, him play like 25 years ago, years before I ever met him. I saw him backing up toots at wetlands in uh, the unreal. early nineties or something like that. And I'm like, who's this like white guy with long hair playing a Les Paul, like just like mine and just fucking like melting the room. But like nice. also playing That's the Jamaican so cool. shit, like spot on the like really hard bubbly pick. Like he was playing yeah. like perfectly. And I was like, man, how is this guy like, you know, playing like the Jimmy Page shit I love and also playing, you know, the like Hux Brown, you know, perfect like reggae bubble. I was like, this guy is, is the guitar player I want to sound like, you know. That's so rad. I didn't know that you, yeah, I didn't know how well you knew him. Um, I, I've when... taken a few lessons from and I got to go back and see him again. I don't know if he's taking people at his house or just doing it online now, but he lives up in the Bronx, so it's like an hour and a half train ride each way, which isn't that bad, and it's, it's whatever, but I gotta just go check him again because it's, you know, he teaches me like chop stuff and, and fundamental stuff, but also like ways of thinking about it, and uh, you know, it, it's really interesting, his lessons, especially coming off like an accident I had where my arm was messed up a couple of years ago. Right, you got in a, really, bike, you got in a bike accident, yeah, I know yeah. that. Yeah, I'm, so, so I'm glad, it, I'm glad it, you, I know it's taken a while to heal, yeah. It, well. it helped me with that and just it was definitely like life changing because it really changed the way I think about guitar and that really affected a lot of other things. So it had really positive effect. Um, but he's great because he was there from 1980, you know, playing Roots Radix, playing at all the studios all over Kingston, backing up oh, Dennis really? Brown for years, backed up Toots. Like, so he really knows how it goes. He know, knows the people and but he knows the styles too. So when you yeah. get it, you know, you're getting lessons from him about something. He's telling you how something is played. You're hearing it right from the horse's mouth. You know, it's like, and he's so he seems to be very you know open about it. So like yeah, you know, willing yeah, to he's, he's a really good teacher. He's glad to teach and spread. So knowledge. cool, man. So cool. Yeah, I hope I hope he's I hope he's writing things down or recording. You know, so, some way that you know, I'm sure he has a lot of experiences to share. A lot so. of the lessons are him. You know, kind of just anecdotes and stuff, which is good because it's. You know, also, too, there's that, like, wisdom that comes with it, you know, of how certain things came to be played certain ways, you know. Yeah. Was, you know last time I saw him, he, he gave me this whole explanation. He was talking about Lynn Tate and about Ernest Wrangler and about how they voiced chords. And he goes into certain settings, he's like, you know, my boy Lollipop, you know, Ernest Wrangler's actually playing the skank up, you know, like they always tell you not to do. And you make fun of the ska guys for doing, but Ernest Wrangland was doing it on arguably the most classic ska record ever. And wow. tell me why he did it, because he was voicing a melody on the E string and whatever, and just the way Lynn Tate would voice stuff. But it's, you know, the, the fundamentals and the, the actual technical lesson is woven together with anecdotes, you know? So it's, it's I, he's a really my, good teacher like that. It's my favorite kind of teacher. And uh, that's, I'm so glad that, uh, you know, that you're taking lessons from him and and there's this knowledge is being passed around you know hopefully um, I'm, I'm absorbing it let's see well you just you just relayed some of it to us so mm -hmm. thank you uh but he the reason he came to my mind is because he shared a video of someone playing like the proper reggae bubble in a studio right like, recently and i can't remember who it was because I, I don't again i'm not i'm on not deep, deep. what's or, that uh, on guitar or keys on the keys yeah i think it was ansel collins yeah i believe that a modern track but he's the guy who played on double barrel which was like a hit in the uk it's a classic early reggae track in 71. okay and he was a studio musician throughout all the 70s 80s he's been on a million records and you That's know so and, he, and that was a perfect example because i saw that clip too and it's like he's playing something really simple like two chords but it's like the pocket is like so on that it mm -hmm. was like 
you think you've heard it done correctly before and it's like it's so subtle you can't put your finger on exactly what it is but it's just you know it's just like jam on toast it's just going yep. exactly that's, where it should be so caught know? my ear i was like whoa yeah. that's the way it's supposed to be done yeah. that's so cool that we're getting this you know little video here yeah. who would have seen it you know it was a modern clip, so it's like 50 years after you know right or whatever yeah so that's so cool man uh so uh we're not you know playing any shows anytime soon i know that the slackers have done you know a couple performances i don't know if we would call them shows but um I haven't played a show in a long time. I don't know when I'm going to. So it's nice to, you know, have music that people are working on. And yeah. um, I look forward to seeing, you know, the you keep cranking things out. And um, I'm going to let you go. And uh, I really appreciate you uh, having yeah, this man, talk. Thanks for and, hitting and, me up. I, I really appreciate it. It's like we did that track yeah. a few months ago. And, you know. I didn't know if it was out yet or what, because almost all the time, I think like with everyone that works on somebody else's track, if you're just a session player or mix engineer or whatever, you kind of work on it, you let it go. Yeah, and it's most of the time yeah. you never even get a copy of it, you know? So it's kind of cool when somebody <laughs> gets back like, hey, we're actually going to talk about this thing. So I had to go so back and that, it again. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, this one's good. Like, you know, yeah. Well, it, you know, it was again like um, it was kind of experimental, which is the nature of the project in general. Um, and it, it was a long distance conversation between us recording the tune and you remixing it. Um, so we may as well get on the horn here and yeah, have this is a cool a idea. personal conversation and uh, learn about more about dub and just kind of like the history of the people that make it. And that's what I think we did. So I, I feel really happy that we did it and i really appreciate you and just uh, everything that's going on and thanks for passing on the that, that knowledge and i hope that we can continue to kind of share that stuff and thanks to everybody else who was who was watching we had a nice crew here of 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 some great people in the comments dan nealon and kayla and you know tony so a bunch of friends here that have been checking it out uh he, uh jlm the third wants to know have you been playing more guitar during the quarantine or have you been working on more dub? Um, I've been, I, I've been in the studio almost all day. So the answer would be, I am in the studio more. Um, Cause that is kind of, I've just made it my day job when I'm off the road to just be in the studio working on something, even if it's like not for a, a client or the slackers just work on something, but I've been good about practicing every day, putting in at least an hour, I try and do two hours. And there've been a couple days here and there, I've been bad, I've had stuff to do at night or whatever, where I've been able to get out and missed a day here or there, but I've actually been pretty regimented about like practicing and even getting a little extra time in every day. That's been a good thing about being off the road. I've been able to do both, you know, but hour wise, I've been in the studio more. That, that must feel really good. I, again, um, I haven't been able to, uh, check in with my chops as much as like, I know quarantine should hypothetically allow and without playing the, sh you know, not playing the shows. I'm like, really, that's a nice inspiration to, you know, do it every day, do a little bit every day, try to make it a little extra if you can. Yeah. Uh, that's, so I'm it's, glad it's, you're glad you're getting that. In. It must feel, that must feel nice. Yeah. Your chops can fall off, you know, definitely mm -hmm. going months without playing. And then also too, I noticed like being on the road can be bad for practicing because it's like, you're like, oh, well, I'm doing a show. I don't need to practice. You totally. Know, all yeah. you know how to do is play the show and you forget how to play other things on your instrument, you know? Right. Right. I'm on the road and I'm like, oh, I have nothing else to do except for these like three hours that I have to perform tonight. And that's right. three hours out of 24. So right. <laughs> a lot of time to do a lot of, a lot of sitting around, but yeah. um, yeah, it's hard, but you know, it's, it's a grind and it's hard to, um, keep a routine together i feel i i found on the road it's hard to like keep a productive mm. routine that doesn't involve just playing the show um so yeah being um not going out and performing and not being on the grind of like getting in and out of the van or the bus or the plane or whatever um has been nice to kind of sit back and reflect i'm trying to kind of get learn five string a little bit more i'm a bass player and um usually i just do fetter position four strings but my buddy left his five string over here and all this like African, like uh, South, 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 South Central African, they go really high, but they like keep the position up on the five, like high up on the five string so they can have access to all these different notes. Uh -huh. like, kind of like keeping like really 
patterns that go like from very high notes to very low notes, right, like okay, in a okay. rhythm. And uh, but then like I love like you know midnight and the Saint Croix sound and all that, and that's like big time, uh, pa you know, uh, active bass like five string sound. So I'm trying to see if not that I can transition, but it's like playing a different instrument and gives right, me a little right. bit of a different inspiration on what to play. So I've been spending my time doing that, but not diligently. Mm. Um, I, I wanted to just say, I know I said I was gonna let you go. I just, we were talking about scientists and right. for me, he's such a big part of like, it, as we know, he's such a big part of dub. I mean, he's the protege of King Tubby. And then he like then went and took it even to different places right. and has just been around for longer to produce yeah. more. Um, we had a really, I've told the story a lot of times, but um, we had a funny run in with him in Malibu many years ago. And um, basically we walked into the Malibu Inn to play a show with Don Carlos and the engineer was there and it was this Jamaican guy. And we, he was like, don't bring your amps in. You're not using your amps tonight. And we were like, we're like, yeah. okay, we're, we're like, uh, well, you know, we're the opening band. I don't, who are you? And this guy's right. like, man, this is the cook. Like the guy next to him, this is the cook, man. This is the chef. This is hoped in the cook. We're like, uh, okay. Uh, you know, uh, and he's like, he's like, he's like, okay, you're going to plug direct in and do your show that way. And you know, nobody's ever told us that. So we're like, okay, we're going to bring our amps on stage. We're just going to do this. Right. And the guy's like, this is scientist, man. Like you got to listen to him. This is scientist. And, uh, it was just a really funny awesome night where he like borrowed our Moog uh, delay pedal and like had it up there on the board at the Malibu Inn, which he had like totally flattened the whole system when he got in and the engineer house engineer was losing his mind. Right. Like, he had like changed everything and scientists didn't give a shit and it was awesome. And, um, and then, and then he wouldn't mic any of our amps because as you were saying before about digital, he's like, these are old fashioned. He's like this. You don't need these. We have a sound system. Like right. I'm the amp. He's like, I'm the amplifier. I'm right. going to make it sound the way that you need to sound. And it was just such a foreign concept that, you know, now well, it, and shortly yeah, after that, he's the artist, you know? That, yeah. That's yeah. And that, that like, you're all right. like, you don't have any input into this. I don't want you touching any of the levels. I'm the guy controlling the levels, you know? Right, right. And I and I, uh, I have this great professor that I always keep talking to from Ithaca College, who's a politics professor. And um, he kind of, he taught this class called the political economy of African diaspora music. And a big part of it was about reggae. And I kind of like explored some like of the history about dub, like kind of taking that course with him. But um, when I was talking about dub and how freeing it seemed, you know, that like, oh, you can really make the songs do anything. He was like, what about the instrument? What about the players? Like the players are totally trapped, like at, right. the, at the helm of like this dictator at the mixing board who like has them in a room and is like can totally silence them if he wants or she wants. But, and, you know, uh, it's, you know, that's a live thing, which is kind of a new thing. But originally, yeah, obviously that stuff was all recorded where the, the, the musicians right. played the stuff for the A side. The exactly, side, exactly. Yeah. You know, and now you're having a situation where it's like, OK, so, you know, I'm I'm out, but I got to keep playing. He could <laughs> leave me out as a guitar player the whole track mostly. But that one time he fades me in for like one guitar chop. I gotta I be there. Be there. So yeah. I have to keep playing, you know. It, it was awesome, and and we we had a really fun show with him. He he mixed us, and then we got to watch him do that with the Don Carlos band, and right. like that, it made so much more sense. Like that, the player, the guitar player, right. was just chopping, right. and he was fading him in and out, throwing the delay on, and uh, Wadi God like just killing on the drums, and he right, right. enhancing everything. So, uh, but uh, the other thing that reminded me about Scientist was that he just put out a Facebook video today. Um, that's talking about these speakers that he made, right, right. Yeah, yeah. and it's it's just uh, it's a great explanation because he's like, you know, we mix reggae music a certain way, and like it has to come out of these certain threshold, like a speaker that can handle a certain threshold. If you're making like weak reggae, any speaker speaker can handle it. Right. If you're making the real stuff, you know, you need. So it's just it's kind again of counterintuitive because if you're mixing a record that can only be played on certain sound system, like. Which means, like, if somebody plays it randomly at home or at a restaurant or they'll whatever, break, they'll break and their system. And like, shit, if people are going to be like, this mix sucks, like, this, you know, yeah. 
that's one of the, th I mean, I guess he knows where he's trying to sell his speakers, but mm -hmm. you know, the, the theory that I'm, you know, everyone wants to like crank the kick and the bass, but it's like, it should sound good on any system from like shitty earbuds to like a thumping, like real reggae sound system. Yeah. It should sound good. I, for me, some of the favorite reggae I heard was like, you know, when you hear like on the little transistor radio that like a lot of people had like in the 60s and 70s, like that's how a lot of people heard reggae. There wasn't like a sound system on every corner 24 hours a day in Jamaica, you know, so it's like, and people didn't have like stereos at their home. Some people did, but a lot of people just had a little transistor radio and the good tracks sound good on those. Yeah, you know? that's totally true. And the, the, the high and the low really like yeah. can still come through. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I think he's like kind of a, he's like kind of a philos like philosophically inclined in his physics of sound, mm. understanding of sound physics. Uh, so that, again, that sounded very exactly on the line of what you were talking about him saying, and then what he was saying to us in the club, he's like, this is future stuff. Like we're working right, with right. big systems. We're making this music that's for this technology. And I just, right. you know, it was really, really, it was a really cool, uh, cool collision to have uh with yeah know, i mean of. you know yeah it's like stereo like 5.1 surround you know stuff like that where it's like okay you can make specific stuff that's meant to be played on a certain system to get a certain experience i get that yeah. you know yeah yeah it was cool it's cool that uh you know we can get these points of view from different people and you know different different understandings so but uh once again man i'm gonna let you go because uh I'm sure you got stuff to do and thank yeah, you for talking with us you're gonna go practice that's amazing yeah. we'll enjoy uh, that and make sure you stretch and uh drink water and uh whatever you, whatever you're gonna do and um thanks for hanging with us i hope we get to work yeah, together again thanks so much say hi to yeah. the guys and uh yeah man good luck in indiana hopefully i'll see you soon yeah i'll get out of here sometime yeah man stay well peace and love yep see y'all see y'all later we'll be gorilla dubbing another time peace